in this series, we're looking at the different attributes of God according to Scripture and asking ourselves and answering according to Scripture, who is God? And we started, I organized this message or this series to start looking uh, primarily in the top part of it at what's called the non-communicable attributes of God. Those things that cannot be communicated to humanity in any way, uh, any way possible of us trying to replicate. For instance, the idea that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere at all times. There's no way we can approximate that. The idea that God is all powerful. There's no way that humans can even begin to understand what it's like to have all power over all things. There's some attributes of God that are called non-communicable. We cannot get close to them. We can just uh, try to understand them and, and how they represent God and who he is. But then there's this other set of attributes of God that are called the communicable attributes, those things that we can understand and then try to emulate, though minimally. For instance, we can understand God is merciful because we can understand what it is to be merciful. We understand that God is love because we have felt and given and received love. So there are some attributes that are communicable. We can understand them and they can be communicated to us in a way that we could even minimally at least represent. And so we've made that transition in this, in this study now. So we're looking at the communicable attributes of God, those things that we can start to get a handle on and start to, as we grow in Christ's likeness, begin to emulate. And so this morning, we're going to look at this idea of truth, that God is truth. We can understand that. We can start to try to emulate that, that idea of knowing truth, understanding truth, and living in truth. So as we set this up, let me just ask this question. Is it ever okay not to tell the whole truth? Is it ever okay to tell a half-truth? Have you heard this, this phrase that uh, a half-truth is a whole lie? Yeah? So if a half-truth is a whole lie, is it ever okay to tell half a truth? You're so non-committal right now. Like there's no conviction in your soul about this right now. Should you tell half truth? No. Should you tell half truth? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is a whole is is half truth a whole lie? I, I think it might be. Is it okay to tell a lie? No. You're so like make a decision one way or the other. Like if you're going to be wrong, at least be confident in your wrongness. Like make a decision. We tell people football all the time. If you're going to mess up, mess up full speed. You understand what I'm saying? So have a backbone right now. Is it okay to tell half a truth? Yes. <laughs> no? Yes? yes. Does your like my, my belly look fat? No, your gut makes your belly look fat. Like, <laughs> how about the G? Make my hips look fat? No, your hips make your hips look fat. It just like what is oh, you're a newborn. It's so cute. No, it's really not. It's a newborn. <laughs> but I mean Newborns aren't cute, generally speaking. Big old cone heads and nasty, nappy, it's just not. I mean, but what do we say? No, the shirt doesn't make your gut look fat. You look in great shape. No, your hips are fantastic. You know, oh, your baby's super cute. It's, is that a lie or not? Again, no commitment out of you whatsoever. So, so let me just, so here's the thing. Does it matter what you think? If it's right or wrong to tell half a truth, you know, I'm committed about that, huh? Let me tell you, this. it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what the Bible says. Okay, so I, it, I don't care necessarily what you think about a half truth, a whole truth, a half lie. Oh, doesn't matter. What I want to know is why do you say that? Because it's got to be based in Scripture. So let me give you a Bible. Genesis 18. Genesis 18, when God comes to Abram, who's super old, who's married to this old, old lady, Sarah. 
And God tells Abram, hey, you and Sarah are going to have a baby. And Sarah, being the wife that she is, is eavesdropping our husband's conversation. I've been doing it for centuries. And Sarah hears God tell Abram that he and her are going to have a baby. And the Bible says in Genesis 18 that she laughs and says to herself, now that I'm old and my husband is really old, I'm going to have a baby. And hearing that, God knowing, God then tells Abram, hey, Abram, why when I told you that you and Sarah are going to have a baby, did your wife laugh and say, she's too old? What part of that truth did God leave out? God left out the truth of what Sarah said when Sarah said that her husband was too old also. God didn't pass that truth on. God didn't say, well, Abram, why did Sarah laugh and say she and you are too old? Why did God only tell half a truth? God left out the part, and understand, God himself left out the truth that would have hurt Abram and made him angry and has caused problems between them. Now listen, according to the Bible, it is not okay to tell the whole truth of everything you know if it's going to hurt someone or their reputation. Do you understand? If you follow the example of God as a Christ follower, Christ followers are not allowed according to God's own example to pass on critical comments and information about other people. You are not allowed to tell everything you know about somebody else. You leave out the negative, even if it's true. The ancient Jewish leader said this, peace according to God, is so great that for its sake, God even modified the truth for the sake of peace. And so just think about this in terms of your conversations and your freaking social media crap, right? How much do you pass on? How much do you say? How much do you join in on? And let me just say this so that I'm not being sexist. Any of you who just like to talk to each other, as you're talking about things and people and lives and kids, if that conversation centers around what might be harmful to someone's reputation or character, or you would feel uncomfortable saying in front of them, keep your mouth. You understand? Some of your conversations are going to get really short now. And I back this up with Genesis 18 from God himself. This is not my agenda. This is God's example. So let me open my message now. Let me start preaching. Dealing with the attribute of God. That God is truth. Let me make a distinction. Because we have to make this distinction. That God doesn't have truth. Because if God had truth, it would mean that truth existed outside of God. God is truth. Nor does God ever tell the truth. That would imply that God could lie. God is true. His very nature, his character, his attribute is truth. So all that God does is true. And all that God says is true. And if all that God says is true, all of God's words are then also true. And so because God is truth, we would be very wise to find out what God has said, how God thinks, and what God does, and stand on the conviction of that truth without complaint and without apology. God's word is true. My strong suggestion is to count on it, build your life on it, and remember Psalm 119, 160, 
All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Imagine for one moment if we agreed to live as if, in fact, all his words were true. Just imagine for a moment if we would live like him. You know what the defini definition of faith is? The definition of faith is acting like God's telling the truth. That's the definition of faith. Jesus talked about the truth of God's word. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them, means make them holy and set apart by the truth. And then he defined, your word is truth. Set them apart and make them sanctified. Let them live according to truth. And by the way, in case you missed it, my word, God says, is true. Last week, we talked about the idea of being sanctified and set apart. The way that we're sanctified and set apart, declared holy, is by living by the truth of God's word. God wanted us to know the truth so much that God had truth come and live on earth in our midst. His name was Jesus. He was the word and he became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said of himself in John 18, the reason I was born, the reason I came to earth, into the world, is to testify to what? To truth. Everyone who's on the side of truth listens, Jesus says to me. Jesus is the living word of God, and he is true. The Bible is the written word of God, and it is true. Now watch this. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way. I'm not a way. I'm not a good way. I'm not the best way. I am the way, and I am the truth. I'm not a truth. I'm not my truth. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, the truth. Jesus, who is truth, then defined and clarified and affirmed that the Bible itself is true. Jesus affirmed the inerrancy and infallibility even of the Old Testament. The inerrancy that means it doesn't have any errors. The word infallible means it's not capable of having errors. Jesus said in Matthew 5 about the Old Testament, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law, the Old Testament, until everything is accomplished. He said this, that the Old Testament is so true and so valid and so reliable and so credible that if any part of it were false, it would fall away and it ain't going nowhere. It's truth. Jesus then went a step further in John 15 and said, when the advocate comes, the advocate is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our advocate for those who have a relationship with Christ. The Holy Spirit advocates on our behalf day and night before the throne of the Father. When the, Holy, when the advocate who is the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of what? The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. He will testify about whom? About Jesus himself, because the Spirit of truth testifies to the truth, which is Christ. Christ. Jesus not only affirms the validity and the credibility and the truth and inerrancy of the Old Testament, Jesus also promises the inspiration of the New Testament through the Holy Spirit, and it's all about him. He's truth, and his words are true. You follow me so far? If you're still thinking, I don't know, though, because there's a lot of stuff in here that's really old. I don't know if this stuff is really true. I don't know if I can really believe it. I don't know. Let me just share with you this. If you need proof of the validity and the historicity of the Bible, just match it up against other ancient documents that there's no one in the world who question both the validity, the truthfulness, and the authenticity of these ancient works. Just consider for a moment. You need proof? Well, listen. Way over on the left, the works, these ancient works, most of you can't even pronounce these things, let alone have any idea what they are, but just understand this. Written way a long time ago, between the time when they were written to their earliest surviving copy. So the time between they were written and their copy, anywhere from 900 years to 1,100 years. I'm sorry, that's when the first copy was, was, was written. So the gap between the first writing and the earlier surviving copy is anywhere from 900 years to 1,300 years. The gap between the first manuscript and the earliest surviving copy of that manuscript. Do you understand that? 900 years to 1,300 years, the gap between them. 
And of those copies, there's anywhere from eight to maybe 20 copies at best. Nobody would question the validity of their historicity or the authenticity of those ancient manuscripts. Compare that to the New Testament alone. The New Testament written between 40 to 180, somewhere in there. The earliest surviving copy was cop we have from AD 130. There's only 300, uh, I'm sorry. The, the earliest surviving copy we have is at 30 AD, 130 AD. That we have the earliest surviving remnant of a copy from 130 AD. The gap between the first writing and all these other manuscripts we have is at best 300 years. Compare 300 years to 900. Compare 300 years to 1300 years. The Bible blows every other manuscript out of the water. And not only do we have this very short gap between the first manuscript and all these other ones, not only that, but when these other manuscripts that nobody questions the authenticity, the, the veracity of them, maybe eight copies, maybe 20 copies of the New Testament, 5,000 Greek copies, 10,000 Latin copies, and over 9,300 others. Why do people choose to not believe the historicity and the validity of the New Testament? Why do people look at this book and think, well, I don't know if I can believe everything in there. It's so old. Nobody questions the validity of all these other ancient manuscripts. Why do they question the validity of Scripture? Do you know why? Because the Bible claims truth. And that's so hard for people to accept these days. There's no other ancient work that we have that comes close to the historicity, the validity, the authenticity of its manuscript compared to what we have in the New Testament. Do you understand? Now, that doesn't make me believe the Bible anymore. It just proves why I believe it. It proves, once again, just another layer. You can't prove to me that the Bible is not true and accurate. So the issue is not, is God's word true? At any level, you look at it. Even historically, archaeology, in every every area you look at it, you can't, it's not an issue of is the Bible true anymore. The issue is will I submit to the truth of the Bible? That's the issue. You understand? You understand? Amen. So last week we looked at the idea that God's holy and we're supposed to, if we follow Jesus, be set apart, be distinct. Jesus then comes up and follows that and says, I'm going to tell you how to do that. You do that according to living to truth, which is my word. And the truth of God's word. Now, let me tell you why truth matters. Let me tell you why this is so important. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew 21, Jesus has a conversation with people that ultimately at its heart has to do with truth. And Jesus says, in the context of this conversation, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him, and they asked him this question. They say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do what you're doing and to say what you're saying? Jesus replied to them, and he said, I'm going to ask you a question. I love the way Jesus responds to people. He doesn't just answer any question they ask. He asks them a question. Well, let me ask you a question. He says, if you answer me, I'll tell you about what authority I'm doing this stuff. So here's my question. You ready? They're like, yeah, we're ready. Go ahead, Jesus. And he says, John's baptism. You know, John the Baptist, the guy who was baptizing people in the Jordan River. He said, that guy, his baptism, where'd it come from? Was it from heaven or was it of human origin? Just tell me the truth. What about his authority? Well, they discussed it among themselves. And they're like, oh, I don't know. So you start talking, okay, if we say it's from heaven, he's going to ask us, how come we didn't believe him? But if we say it's just from human origin, we're afraid of getting canceled. Right? We're afraid of the people, for they all hold that he's a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, well, we don't know. And so Jesus said, then neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Jesus said, look, you want to play games with the truth? Our conversation's done. 
When, when they asked Jesus about his authority in verse 23, tell us by what authority, who gave you this authority? That's a Greek word called exousia, and it means literally authority or laying on of hands. And in the Jewish faith, and some Christian churches practice the same thing, the idea of laying on of hands in the service of an ordination, it's intended to pass on the authority from a greater into a lesser to raise their authority so that they can now function in the authority of those who are laying on the hands of. And so what happens is the chief priests are actually asking Jesus, who ordained you? What were their credentials? What authority did they have that would give you that authority to do the things that you're doing. Here's why they're concerned. Because Jesus had been speaking truth. And they want to know, where's your authority for what you say? God, Jesus was speaking truth about God. Jesus was speaking truth about their practices. And they want to know, where's your authority to claim truth? Jesus was even interpreting their own law by which they were holding people See, the mere teachers of law in Jesus' day, the scribes were not allowed to make new interpretations, nor were they allowed to make legal judgments. They were only given authority to simply explain what the law says, but not to make interpretations about it. Only the priests and the Pharisees could make interpretations and interpret law. Jesus comes into that environment, and he starts to reinterpret law. He says, you've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, don't commit murder. I say, don't hate your brother in your heart. You've heard it say, don't commit adultery. I say, don't lust after a woman. You've heard it said, but I still starts interpreting law. Not only that, he explains the law of Moses by which they thought they had a corner on. Not only that, he rides into Jerusalem as a king. And not only that, he disrupted the temple proceedings and disrupted their money changing. And he claims to teach with authority as one with truth. And they say, Jesus, if you're going to claim authority, where's your truth? If you're going to claim truth, where's your authority? We got to see it. And Jesus says, you say you want to know truth, but you play games with it. They say they want to know the truth behind Jesus' words, but they play games with it. Verses 24 and 25. I'm asking you a question. Where's John's baptism come from? What's the truth behind his authority? Did it come from God or was it human origin? Jesus makes them confront truth. He makes them come to terms with the truth. In other words, he says, this guy who was baptized, he baptized me. Where did his authority come from? Tell me the truth. Jesus gave them the opportunity to accept, to know, to confess, to verbalize, to acknowledge truth. And what was their response? But we don't know. They start doing the mental gymnastics in their head. If we say this, then this. If we say this, then this. If we admit the truth was from God, there's authority for us from God, then we stand in error and we cancel our own authority. But if we say what we want to say, that we don't believe his authority was from God, then we get canceled. Here's the deal. Cancel culture has been around a long time. See, our prop, the problem is not that there is cancel culture. That's not the only problem. Our problem is when Christ followers bow and cower to cancel culture and start playing games with truth. This is why truth, this is why the acknowledgement, the understanding, the adherence to it is so important. This is why, right here. Jesus asked them, identify truth. They want to play games with it. What was Jesus' response? I'm done with you. I'm done. You and I are not going to have a conversation anymore. You want to play with truth? I am the truth. You going to play with me? We're done. Here's what happens when we start playing games with the truth. Jesus won't interact with those who play games with it. Do you understand? Jesus says, if you're going to play games and based on your own self-protection and the environment that you're in right now with what you claim to be truth, I'm done with our conversation. Jesus will not move in those lives who are afraid of the truth, nor will Jesus act on behalf of those who are afraid to stand on and profess truth, nor will Jesus come to those who seek their own self-preservation rather than stand on truth, nor will he speak with those who sacrifice truth, nor will he come to those who cower to cancel culture. He just won't play games with truth. 
See, these who Jesus was talking to, they didn't really want to know the truth because they didn't really want to speak the truth because there was no way they were ever going to commit to the truth. They didn't want to say what would then be unpopular to ears that were around them. They wanted to say what would keep them protected and they wanted to not say what people didn't want to hear. Playing games with the truth will make people stupid. Did you hear about Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head? There's no more Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. You have to de-gender a potato. My friend BJ told me that Oreo just announced that their cookies are no longer, they're, they're not a gendered cookie. Did you know that? In case any of you were wondering, if Oreo had a gender, Oreo has just reassured us that their cookies are non-gendered cookies. It's a cookie! (laughs) How much do you want to redefine? There's truth. It is about time that a few people at least acknowledge and accept truth, not your truth, not my truth, but truth as revealed in Bible. See, we're in a time now where truth is not popular. Not only is truth no longer popular, truth has become non-existent. See, we moved from a couple generations ago when there was truth. There was right and there was wrong, and there was truth and there was falsehood. And we moved to a time in my generation when you could have your truth and I could have my truth. And those two truths could be completely different, but they both be true, which was absolutely asinine. But we moved from that to a time when there is no truth. Now, there's only, in my words, affirmed, unquestioned experience. And whatever you define your experience to be, that That is truth, and I'm not allowed to question it. I'm not allowed to disagree with it. It's your experience, and that is sacred. Now, this is ridiculous because there's no more truth. And the result is, in this culture, if my truth doesn't fit hand in glove with the culture, I get canceled. Well, too freaking bad. I don't care because there has to be truth. Because in the absence of truth, There's chaos. Now, this is really important here. Why this issue of truth is... If we won't deal with truth, Christ will not deal with us. Because he is truth. And once we make truth relative, we have then made Jesus relative. And Jesus is anything but relative and optionally important. So if you claim Christ, and if you don't be here, just consider this stuff. Just listen. Keep considering it. Watch the way of Christ followers and see if it doesn't make sense. But if you claim Christ as a Christ follower, you cannot, we cannot give in to relativism. There are objective binding moral standards that do not change regardless of culture And if you are a Christ follower, you cannot give in to cancel culture when it comes to truth. Cancel culture will always silence the shout of God. Here's the reality. I've already been canceled by my own sin. I've disqualified myself because of my sin. Sin has already canceled every person. But the honest truth is the church should be the place for all of us who have already been canceled because of our own sin. Do you understand? 
If I've canceled myself because of my own sin, I don't care what anybody else says about me because I've canceled myself because of my sin and God has uncanceled me because of his mercy and grace. That's the glorious thing about the truth of who God is. Though sin has canceled us all, I thank God for his mercy and grace because that has uncanceled what I have previously canceled because without God's mercy and grace, I stand condemned and canceled already. But the truth of God is that he loved me so much that he uncanceled by cancellation. Do you understand? Flip side, I ought to call ourselves the church of the canceled. <laughs> we need a new logo. I don't know what that look like. I don't know how that plays on social media. I wouldn't like a, I don't know whether that'd be like a flip side with a little line through. I don't know what the. You've already been canceled because of your sin. And praise God because of his mercy and grace is willing to uncancel you. So it doesn't matter what anybody else says. You stand on truth. Flipside will always stand on the truth of God. That Jesus is the only way to salvation. That it's salvation by faith because of God's grace. That's the truth of God that we'll stand on. The truth that we have all already been canceled because of our sin. And the truth that it is grace that has restored us from our own cancellation. It's the truth that mercy and grace are profound for those who have been canceled. And that we will stand on truth above all cultural norms. And we will stand above on truth above all self-proclamation of gender and above all self-proclamation of victimization and above all self-proclamation of intersectionality and have been all above all self-proclamation of offense will stand on truth regardless because if we redefine truth we nullify the very bedrock of who God is and we remove ourselves from Jesus involvement in our lives this is important God is truth, and to redefine that and to minimalize that and to remove that removes the bedrock of who God is. We have to consider this, that until we accept that God is truth, we remove ourselves from every promise of God in the Bible. Either this is true, holy, or it is not true at all. And if God is truth and his word is truth, until we accept that, we remove ourselves from every promise that is in here. We have to ask ourselves, was God telling the truth? Is God telling the truth when he said all things work together? for those who love you are called according to my purpose. Is God telling the truth when he said no weapon formed against you will stand? Is God telling the truth when he said tithe and I'll open up the windows of heaven and flood you with so much blood you won't have room to contain it? Was he telling the truth or was he lying? Was God telling the truth that said by my name of Jesus and the authority of that name you can move mountains and dispel powers and dominions of the devil? Was he telling the truth or was he lying? Was he telling the truth when he said you can heal infirmities and bring joy in the morning? Was he telling the truth or is he not? Was he telling the truth when Jesus said I am God or was he lying to us? Was he telling us the truth or not? When he said, my mercies are new every morning, great is my faithfulness. Was he telling the truth? He said, I'll make clean that which once was filthy. I'll clean you and restore it. Was he telling the truth or was he lying? There's sometimes When I get a little bit worked up about the Bible, about my God, this is why it's so important. Listen, if you have children, they are not going to get truth anywhere but from here out of your mouth. They're not going to get it anywhere else. And these kids are growing up in a world that has relativized truth, so truth doesn't exist anymore. And once that happens, God doesn't exist anymore. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. I understand how it happened. Even Pilate standing face to face with Jesus looked at Jesus who was the truth of God in bodily form and asked Jesus, what is truth? I understand the confusion. Here's my suggestion between now and Easter. 
Start today. Read a chapter a day through the book of John and through the book of Mark. It'll all get you all but one day right past Easter of taking this in here and here and this 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 here. Because here's what I'm going to, you're not going to get the truth anywhere else. I understand why people are so confused. They get truth from CNN and from Fox News. They're so confusing. Just dumbs everybody down. And then when you know what to believe, you go to social media and get truth from there. Oh my gosh, that's asinine. <laughs> There's truth. God is true. His word is true. Here's the deal. This is... I want to be like... Some of you, you're older. I want to be like my friend Scott. He's old. <laughs> And he's built his life on the truth of God's word. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like he said, look, I'm just full enough, so, enough to believe this Bible. And I'm going to build my life on it. I'm going to build my marriage. I'm going to build my kids. I'm going to build. I want to be like that. Because I'm not as old as you. But there are others here. Man, you're still undecided. You still have not agreed that this is true. Every word of it. And you're building your lives on shaky ground. And I just think that for some of you today, this is going to be your day. This is going to be your day. When you're going to choose to accept truth of who God is as revealed in the Bible. And you're going to choose today to start believing and acting like you really do believe every word in the Bible as the truth of God. Otherwise, you're going to run the risk of saying to Jesus, saying to you, I'm done talking to you until you acknowledge truth. Now, just for a moment, imagine. Just, just imagine. Don't worry about them coming up here. You've seen them come up every week. This ain't nothing new. Stick with me here for a minute. Just imagine for a minute. Just think for a minute. Let your mind dream for a minute. Imagine for a minute if we really believed and practiced the truth of God's word. Didn't believe it part of the time, depending on who we're around. Didn't worry about cancel culture saying this or that about it. Didn't worry about the con. Just stood on. Imagine for a moment what would happen if we both believed and practiced the truth of God's word. Just think. If you believe that this stuff is true, how would your view of God change? If you believe that all this stuff is true, how would your view of God, how would your prayers change? How would your life change? How would your acts, how would you? Like if you really believe, we really believe this. Do you realize what we have in our hand? I'm sorry, I got to be modern. Do you realize what we have on our phones? <laughs> Do you know people died so that we could have this? Like this is so sacred and special. Do you realize what we have? The truth of Almighty God. Like he's taken all of God's self and said, I'm going to show you exactly who I am and what I do and what I love and how I interact with you and what I want for you. I'm going to put everything. Do you realize what we have right here? The truth of God. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, God, every word of yours proves true. You are a rev you're a shelter for those who take refuge in you. Do you realize what we have? Do you realize how families change when they're built on this? Do you realize how marriages change when they're built on this? You remember what you can you imagine what happens to your kids when the kids build their lives on this? And yet we acquiesce to a culture that doesn't allow us to stand on this, that shames us when we do, that cancels us when we speak out. And we, 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 want, we, we want that value more than we... The implications are profound. And for me, it's so exciting. 
Like, I don't know why all of you don't preach. I, I don't know why all of you don't like, yeah, let's talk the Bible. This is incredible. This is, I don't know if I'm doing a good job communicating to you what it is we have and what happens. Most of us have tried to build our lives on something other than this. You know the results. You know why you've had those results? Because it's built on lies. This changes everything. Changes everything. And I've got to get this into my life because it's truth. Because I am such a fool, I will fall for every lie that's out there. And I'll believe every word that's told me that I'm not sure about what's going on. And until I get this here, I'm going to be an ass. This is what saves me. God, you told us in Proverbs 30 verse 5 that every word of yours proves true and that you are a shield and a shelter for those of us who take refuge in you. And there are some who this day who will choose in this moment to build their lives on the truth of your word. Do exactly what you said you would do in your word that you will prove every word of it true. And as we rely on this as the truth of our lives, be our shelter because you are our refuge you have to do it because your word is true and we stand on it